Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where our goal is to help you find health and community through movement. I'm Molly Herford, a writer, coach, and yoga teacher. And I'm Peter Glassford, an endurance coach and kinesiologist. Every week, we're talking to athletes and experts who can help you lead your best active, adventurous life. Whether you're a gravel racer, a marathon runner, or you just got out on your first bike ride yesterday, we're here cheering you on. You can also visit us online at consummateathlete.com for coaching information and training tips, nutrition advice, yoga flows, bike skills, and more. And now, let's get into this week's episode. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Peter, how's it going? It's going well. Yeah, I've been trying to wrangle this little miniature dachshund of ours and trying. he's been getting lazy, so we're trying to increase his training load here a little bit. You said that to him yesterday, and then suddenly he was just like popping up rock walls and like just trying to like edge into the bay to, to go for a swim yes. yesterday. Well, so. sometimes we all just need a little bit of feedback and mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. objective, you know, coaching. Yep, yep. Uh, I, on the other hand, need a rest day like never before. It's been a busy weekend here. Just did a very big uh, trail trail marathon. Just, you know, me and, and a friend, not me and a start line or anything. We're not quite there yet, but we're working on it. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was super good. I was very happy to have a nice sunny day. Uh, very crisp day, actually. Pretty optimal trail running conditions. It was like 43 degrees, which I believe is around 5 Celsius for the Canadian listeners. So we had the the giant debate actually during the run over the uh, tights versus shorts at that temperature because it is right on the cusp. So I was actually pretty stoked with myself because I had opted for, for pants. My I would actually say in the past couple of years, I've changed my temperatures where I start wearing pants, uh, you know, at a, at a warmer temperature now. I think you have the 15 degrees and under and there are leg warmers is your... Well, and that's for cycling too. I think it is a little sport specific, but I would say anyone who's had knee pain usually starts wearing, covering their knees at a higher temperature but, mm-hmm. or at a, yeah, higher temperature. Yeah, yeah. I actually remember Brad Huff, who's a past US uh, crit champion, talking about as soon as he hit a certain age, he shifted to wearing knee warmers unless it was very, very warm out. Yeah. For that exact reason. And so actually over on consummateathlete.com or on our Instagram at consummateathlete, we have a, a clothing matrix for cyclists that people seem to be appreciating lately. I did yeah. uh, temperature, but then also like sunny versus rainy and sort of what we would wear. Well, I think that's the reality, right? Is a little bit of wind or a little bit of sun or, you know, even just the time of year I find changes. You know, there's the classic, you know, in the spring, every, everything seems way warmer. It's true. The and one then degree. In the fall, in the fall, the first, you know, drop below 70 degrees or 20 panic, you know, celsius panic. and everyone's bundled up so there's probably a bit of that too true true so what i really liked about the idea of making a clothing matrix wasn't the it wasn't that like everyone's just going to print this out and this is theirs um the idea was that you actually think about what you tend to do and the idea is to get you out the door faster we talk about all, this a lot in our book becoming a consummate athlete you know the more sort of organized you can be, the more routinized you can be, the more time on bike or on the run you're going to have, right? Like if you don't have to bring the bike downstairs, realize that like, oh, I should have worn a jacket instead of a vest and have to go up and change and switch it out and do all those and these things. Are, these are just sort of the rules of thumb, right? That sort of just take some of that decision-making power. It's the end of the day. You've made so many decisions for the kids and at work and everything else, right? You don't need to decide vest or no vest. Just put the vest in you know, in the back of your pocket, or I always talk about the bag up the front of my shirt. Um, and then it just stows in your pocket. Right. And, and similar with tools, right? It's like, if the tools are just always in your back pocket or in your saddle bag or whatever your system is, there's no decisions. There's no forgetting it's there when you need it. Exactly. So I love a good matrix. I love a good checklist. I think everyone should make their own matrix, print it out, have it in their closet so they know exactly what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And it's just much faster out the door. Um, and all of that kind of comes down to to the idea of doing your own detective work, sort of knowing knowing what works for you. I actually was talking with uh, with Alex Coates about this when we did a, a Red S presentation. You can actually get the whole video of that over at consummateathlete.com too. Um, and we were talking about, you know, when you're dealing with, are you sort of veering into Red S territory, you really do need to do your own detective work. You need to be your own best advocate. And that's that's both subjective and objective data. You know, it's knowing how you're feeling every day. Like, are you feeling moodier, more irritable? You know, are things starting to go a little sideways? But it's also being being your own advocate and doing sort of your own your own tracking of some of these objective measures. So that's why I'm actually super stoked to introduce a new sponsor to the show, Inside Tracker. 
Uh, so they do uh, blood, DNA, and fitness tracker sort of testing. They bring it all together and provide customized recommendations. And we've actually used them in the past. They had a woman who showed up at our door, took our blood, left, and then we got these like beautiful PDFs and CSV files with all of our information. Uh, doctor was super happy about having that info without having to, you know, requisition forms. If you live in Ontario or in Canada, you know, it's, you know, tough to get a doctor to test a bunch of things when you're outwardly pretty healthy. Uh, and in the States, you know, it's pretty expensive to get all those things tested, whether you're going through a doctor or not. Um, so having, you know, one place that just did it all, it was, it was awesome. And it, for me, it actually illuminated a, a couple of markers that I definitely well, didn't know. I think that's know. it, right? I have a lot of clients that haven't been to the, you know, as you say, they're, they're healthy. They haven't been to the doctor and it's always a struggle to make them go. You know, they're healthy. There's no urgent need in their mind to go. They don't like going to the doctor. Now with the pandemic, no one wants to go to the hospital. So there's a lot of things where, you know, maybe we can get, just check, prove it. You know, it's always, I think there's a, fr someone says this, the, there's the proof is in the blood or something like that, right? Uh, Isn't that pudding? Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, we have that we have you know as endurance athletes especially for the females but really anyone who's pushing the limits you know if you're going to altitude we, we want to be checking this you know what is the iron status was the ferritin you know any of these things you know are you healthy and ready to go to altitude so we're going to go do leadville we're going to do a training camp you know i have a lot of clients in this boat again it's like will you go and get the blood work and how do you do it right and, and this how i think is, is what this uh inside tracker really solves nicely right and you might just be busy i have busy clients that just don't have the time they're taking care of kids so if we can get this done at home we get it done right yeah. if there's a, a link to click here's the link and here is the link it's inside tracker.com slash consummate thanks for leading me in for that here i tried uh, yeah so inside tracker.com slash consummate and you actually get 25 percent off the entire inside tracker store so that's like an insane deal it's available for a limited time so definitely get over there and check it out and yeah that's that's all about that and now let's chat about today's episode so we have ultra runner north face athlete red bull athlete dylan bowman on today talking about ultra running um, at the time this is going to come out he will have uh, completed his backbone potential fkt i don't want to like say if he got it or not because i'm actually not positive we're recording this intro before he's finished with his attempt oh, okay all right so he's down in sunny california yep yep we're a little bitter up here uh he and i talk about sort of everything as far as ultra running but also like balancing sport with a full-time job like people are pretty surprised to realize a lot of the pro runners out there especially like in the ultra scene have like full-time jobs that they do and you're talking about a hundred miler so I think we can say we know a lot of people who are, you know, trying to train a lot more than they maybe have time for during the week. They're trying to put in like 20, 25 hour training weeks. And Dylan and I talk about what a training week looks like for him. And let me tell you, he's doing, you know, he's podium, podium at Leadville and his big weekend runs are still, you know, sub five hours most of the time. Right. which sounds like a lot for someone who's training for like a 10K. But when you think about like a hundred miler is a 24 hour ordeal mm -hmm. and he's still, his long runs are five. Well, I think that's what you see with running, especially, right? You just can't achieve these huge weekly hours by running. Like the body just can't handle that. Right. And this is, you know, your elite marathoners and it doesn't change a ton as you get into the ultra marathon. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's that's what I've found, too. I mean, I can't say that I'm podiuming at Leadville yet, but, you know, I've been working my way up in the, the mileage that I'm trying to do or is my goal, but my weekly mileage doesn't really change that much. It just sort of shifts and pivots to kind of add longer runs on the weekends, but it takes time out during well, and the week. builds right i think that's when i look at plans often it's you know is there an off day is there an off week you know is there a deload week of something and week can be flexible and then you know is it building like you just did this uh trail marathon on the weekend but then if i know david probably next weekend's going to be you know it's going to be like a 16 mile or a Ooh, 18 you're close right so it's not like like once you achieve this this output you're going to like just you have to keep it there. And I think that's the mistake we make is we assume everything like we have to hold on to this fitness forever. So you'll see plans where it's like now someone has to do a trail marathon every single weekend forever or else they'll lose the fitness forever. Right. And, mm -hmm. and there isn't that ebb and flow. Right. The off days, the deload weeks, the, you know, finish the block. I, I have a lot of this like big ride to finish the block. And we do that every four weeks or so. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think 
good messages there. Yeah, I I could not stop talking about this interview in, in the days afterwards. I think there's just so many really smart tips in here, whether you're hoping to do an ultra or you're just, you know, running or riding or any kind of endurance sport. He has a ton of great advice. Uh, and we also quickly talk about the upcoming Red Bull Wings for Life run, and that's happening on May 9th, so this coming Sunday. Oh, okay. Cool virtual run. It so, sounds like a really fun thing, supporting a really good and cause. And people can still get involved with it? Yeah. Okay, yep. this should be there might be some people who sounds interesting and it's not super ultra distance no, it is not an ultra for some distance. people it might be 2k yeah exactly and i will let him explain exactly what the right. parameters are uh but definitely check that out and it's a little different too so it's it, as you say he can explain it but it's it's a, a nice twist on a run race yeah a, exactly. a virtual challenge even, like right? i'm not usually a virtual challenge person but i'm intrigued by this one okay so. well people have to listen to find out exactly all right enjoy this episode with dylan bowman Dylan Bowman, welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm psyched we finally managed to make this work. Yes. Hey, Molly. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate you uh, being flexible with my scheduling uh, mishaps. I promise I'm not uh, that high maintenance usually. So I appreciate you having me on the show. I'm excited for our conversation. Uh yeah, of course. And I actually, I was going to start with your origin story, but I actually kind of really want to just hear about what like a couple days of training look like normally for an ultra runner such as yourself. So walk me maybe through just like the past couple days of training for you. So actually, the last couple of days have been fairly mellow. Uh, I'm gearing up for a speed record attempt on a trail here in Southern California, which is why I had some scheduling mishaps with you because my plane got all screwed up yesterday. And but because of the fact that I'm I'm gearing up for a long run this coming weekend, uh, the last couple of days have been mellow because I'm just kind of tapering and, and resting up. Typically, though, what I would say is I guess like a couple of a, maybe a week or so ago when I was sort of putting the uh, finishing touches on the training. Um, the last couple of runs I did were back to back four hour runs Saturday and Sunday, two weekends ago. And the run on Saturday also had a couple of 20 minute interval pushes in there as well, just to kind of simulate that race pace intensity and, uh, yeah, sort of make it a little bit more difficult. So yeah, not, not every day is four hours. I would say most days are uh, yeah, I would say an average of one to two, two and a half maybe um, throughout the week. So I think uh, the important thing to note is that with ultra running, you don't necessarily need to, you know, 10x your training volume, even though your the race distance might be 10x a, a 10k or whatever. So um, yeah, uh, I like I'm l lucky to have a good coach who who sort of puts all the pieces together for me and. Uh, I've been lucky to have a long career as a result. Nice. And actually, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I, I was going to say, you know, you do 100 milers, 100K races. Um, really, a four hour run is not that crazy sounding for, you know, for, for most people. I mean, it sounds long, but yeah. <laughs> it sounds doable, right? It's not like you're out there doing 10 hour runs every single weekend. Right. Um, and what, is, yeah. what does tapering look like? Well, just uh, like this morning, I just went for a nice, easy hour flat. Um, and that's typically what most of the taper week looks like. A lot of laying on the couch, drinking a lot of water, uh, eating good foods, and just generally letting all the hard training kind of rise to the surface, you know, uh, so you can absorb all the hard work, freshen up a little bit so that you can really empty the well when it matters most. Mm hmm. Uh, now, coming back to your origin story as a, a lacrosse player originally, um, <laughs> who is now saying, oh, yeah, I do an hour casual easy. Like, that's my that's my like rest day. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a pretty big, pretty big leap. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, back us up. You were playing lacrosse and then you did one marathon and then suddenly you're doing Leadville. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you pretty much nailed it. So I grew up uh, a team sport athlete. I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, which of course everybody knows is sort of an endurance sport, mountain sport mecca. But I uh, didn't really. Yeah, who call... plays lacrosse in right. Boulder? It's funny too because like when I was growing up, that was sort of like the advent of lacrosse, kind of making its way west across the United States. Obviously, most people associate it with 
East Coast prep schools, and I was very much, you know, public school Boulder, Colorado boy. And the uh, advent of lacrosse uh, was sort of happening as I was like maturing as an athlete. I was playing sort of football and basketball, and and then when I found lacrosse, it really was like the sport for me because, and I really, I, I don't know, I like talking about lacrosse because it's such a freaking cool game. And uh, it, for those who are less familiar with it, it has sort of the finesse of soccer and basketball mixed with a little bit of physicality like hockey or football. And it's a game of momentum. It's fast paced. You know, you cover a lot of ground on the field. So it's very athletic, too, and, and oftentimes very exciting. And so it was like the perfect sport for me. I, I really loved playing. I ended up playing through high school and college. And then it was after college um, that my lacrosse career had sort of come to a close. And I was living in Aspen, Colorado at the time. And uh, I was still very much in sort of like college mode, going out too much, doing a lot of partying. And uh, after a little while, uh, having been an athlete my entire life, there came a time where I was starting to not really like the person I was turning into. I was starting to miss the daily grind of going to practice and things like that. And so I just started running just to stay fit, stay active. And because I was living in Aspen, I just started running in the mountains and running trails. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was after uh, a short time that I kind of learned about these longer distance races and specifically the lead bill 100. Uh, it was just something that like really spoke to me at that moment in my life where I was really kind of trying to figure out the direction that I wanted to take both as an athlete and professionally. And luckily it allowed me to sort of bring the athlete and professional parts of my life together. And, uh, yeah, it's been geez, 11 years now. And, uh, I would have never guessed that this would have been the path that I've been on, but it's been truly a gift and I've loved every minute of it. I love it. Now, ultra running 11 years ago was not really a traditional career path. I mean, (laughs) maybe now you can sort of see like, okay, it's, you know, really bloomed in the last few years, but a decade ago, that's, that's a pretty big leap to make to just be like, this is, this is my career now. So how did that actually transpire? Well, slowly, I guess I should say. So it's kind of similar to the lacrosse thing. And that when I started playing lacrosse, it was right when lacrosse was starting to become a bigger sport. Um, and the, as, and it was moving West, as I mentioned. And then when I got into ultra running, it was like right at the moment in time where, uh, Born to Run, the book came out, and Dean Carnaz's book called Ultra Marathon Man had come out not long before either. And so there was this wave of momentum into the sport at the time, and that's only continued since then. And mm-hmm. so I, I very much felt like I sort of came in on the ground floor again of like a, a, a new sport. And that has sort of like a motivating quality to it as well. And luckily for me, um, my career has been able to kind of grow with the sport. So obviously those, those first few years, I mean, you could call it being professional, but it wasn't as if I was really like um, making a living doing it. And, and I guess I should say I've always kept a day job as well. Most of the pro athletes do. Um, and, you know, luckily now in this newer generation, a lot of the best athletes are able to be fully professional. And I think that trend is only going to continue as the sport continues to grow and professionalize. And um, so, yeah, like I said, it's a a career path that I never really thought that I would be on. And it's sort of slowly snowballed. And it's really been, especially in the last five or so years to where it's been a substantial part of my livelihood as a person. And um, I feel immensely grateful for that being the case. Mm -hmm. Now, do you feel like, and this is like an argument I sometimes make, do you feel like actually having to have like another job for those first years actually maybe saved you from some like burnout, some injury, that kind of stuff? A hundred percent. And I guess I should say I've entertained the idea of going fully professional multiple times over the course of my career and never have. And I am very happy that's the case for a couple of reasons. Obviously, I uh, I turned 35 this year and very much still have uh, very high motivations to compete and 
uh, perform at the level that I have to this point in my career. But you start to feel the urgency of time a little bit. And you start to f- think about, okay, well, when things do come to a close, how am I going to set myself up for the next chapter of my life? And I very much feel like I have done that well. And also, uh, to your question about injury and stuff, in 2019, I dealt with injury for really the first time in my entire athletic career, going back to even when I was a kid playing team sports and lacrosse. I just was really lucky, never got injured. And it was in that year when I was injured in 2019, where I was just like, thank goodness I never left my job because it gave me something to keep me busy, to keep me mentally engaged every day and to keep me just still involved in the sport. The the job that I do is still very much sort of centered around sport and performance, which is my passion in life. And so uh, it fits really well with the athletic side of my career as well. And uh, I'm lucky to be able to do it anywhere. So when I travel to race and stuff, I can still get my work done on the computer. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been really lucky to, to have uh, a career outside of running as well. And I think it actually has helped to enhance my career as an athlete. Mm-hmm. It's actually really funny. I was just talking to a, a clinical psychologist about this for, for kids yesterday to talking about um, body image and identity after or like after sport or if they're uh, injured and like away from sport. And we talked about the fact that you need to have another thing that defines you and like helps you become like be a whole person because if, if all of your eggs are in the sport basket, uh, if that's taken away, yeah. Like what do you do all day? (laughs) Oh, it's so destabilizing. And it's something that I like to talk about a lot on, on my podcast as well. And, uh, I think is one of the key things that I try and stress to younger athletes as I really try and focus now on mentoring the next generation of athletes coming into the sport is yeah. Being more than just an athlete and, and being diversified in how you you are impacting your athletic life. And like, for example, for me, I didn't start this podcast until a little more than a year ago. And that is just like brought, brought me so much joy and obviously is still very much related to my life as an athlete. And as you know, just like being able to connect with people on, on podcasts and have conversations with them is really personally fulfilling, but it also allows you to have a greater impact outside of uh, standing on podiums or posting on Instagram and things like that. And so, um, I always try and encourage younger athletes who are coming up in the sport with professional ambitions to try and figure something else out that they can do, whether it's getting a, a, a side job or yeah, starting a podcast or YouTube or any number of things that you could do to, yeah, sort of, as you said, kind of keep your athletic and personal lives in balance. Oh my gosh, you're you're so speaking my language. I literally like wrote a book on this that was uh, the Athlete's Guide to Sponsorship for like younger athletes, and <laughs> nice. it's all about this. It's nice. oh my gosh, so good. I'm I'm totally gonna have to like post this all over the place. But actually, uh, gotta, I noted your read podcast. It. Yeah. I know I'm gonna have to send you a copy. I feel yeah. like you would appreciate it deeply. <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. <laughs> okay, your podcast actually. Um, let's let's talk about that. Why, why did you start it? How's it been going? Who is the coolest guest that you've gotten to have on? Oh, uh, yeah. So um, thank you so much. Yeah. So my podcast I've been doing now for about a year and a half, I guess. And it's kind of strange because I have always been like a sports radio guy. I, going back to when I was a kid, I've just always been a huge fan of sports. And to this day, I still listen to sports radio almost every single day. And I was also kind of like an early adopter to podcasts and like was listening to Bill Simmons on the early versions of the iPhone. Like like when you had to like download them and like put them onto your like iPod and stuff. Yep. (laughs) Um, And so, and I've always wanted to do it. And I've always like kind of known that um, it would be something that I would really enjoy. And because Um, I have always been busy with my day job and traveling and racing and stuff. I just always had excuses as to why I I couldn't do it. And then in that year that I was injured, it was finally like, okay, I don't really have an excuse to do this or to not do this. And then of course, going into the COVID year when I wasn't really traveling and racing, it gave me the opportunity to, to like really lean into it and commit to it. 
And my goodness, it's just brought me so much joy and I absolutely love it. We, uh, we just launched a, an app. So my, my podcast used to be called The Well, which is sort of like, um, it, I guess, uh, a, a endurance specific word sort of signifying the source of energy that we go to, like, like going, going to the well. well. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, and we, we launched an app called Pillars. And so I changed the name of my podcast to the Pillars podcast just to sort of keep everything I'm working on under No, we should roof. know that this is P-Y-L-L-A-R. Right, right exactly. To look for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, we, so explain that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, well, so the, the name was very much sort of like, um, we're, we're sort of our philosophy to, to start is very much to kind of like focus on how to bring people into the sport and how to make trail and ultra running a little bit less in, intimidating, understanding that when people hear about the sport, they often hear about these 100 mile races and it can be very much, uh, yeah, intimidating and, and unapproachable to um, sort of the novice athlete or just kind of an endurance curious person. And so giving people as many tools as they possibly can to come into the sport and also providing community. But then the pillar's name was sort of around this philosophy that we have about you know, combining our physical fitness with our emotional fitness. And this is born out of my experience with injury and what we were just talking about, about like kind of having an identity crisis and really learning that you have to cultivate that, that emotional fitness and that internal health and balance in the same way that you have to cultivate your physical training and that the two are equally important in your ultimate performance as an athlete. And I think that's just something that hasn't been talked about enough. And so anyway, that's what we're trying to do with the app. I brought the the podcast sort of under the same branding umbrella. And um, yeah, we're, we're super excited about what we're doing. And um, yeah, the, the podcast has been a, a great way to sort of uh, kind of share the stories of, of athletes in the sport. And I definitely have, I guess, a bias towards the professional athletes just because I, I feel an identification with them and uh, have just loved being able to share their stories as somebody who knows what they go through and knows how tough it is and how not glamorous it is sometimes. You know, when you see professional athletes posting on Instagram, you just feel like, their lives are perfect and everything's fine and whatever. But in reality, like I know it's a really hard way to make a living. And when you do hit adversity, like you do sort of have existential crisis about, well, is my career coming to an end? Am I going to lose my sponsorship? Am I washed up? Is it over for me? And so trying to, um, yeah, help, help uh, these athletes tell their stories and help the general public get a better understanding of what it takes to perform at your best. Oh my gosh. I love it. Uh, it's so funny. I could talk to you about like business and branding and all of that stuff for forever. I feel like, so, and I'm hi. like, no, so, I need so to, I. we, we yeah, need to talk just, about sport. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. might have to I come mean, back to this at some other point. Yeah, um, it, candidly, we're, we're also thinking about, yeah, our brand right now too. And if it actually does fit, then now I'm like, oh, I don't want to rebrand everything again. So anyway, but I could talk about it for days too. So maybe we should have yeah. a phone call later in the week or something. I think we're going to have to, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so of all of the athletes that you've had on, as you're talking about all of this stuff with them, has anyone given you a piece of advice or like a kernel of wisdom or like an idea even that's changed how you think about like fueling or training or resting or any any habits? Sure. So I, I guess the other thing that I should say is that I, I try to avoid a lot of the uh, basic stuff too, like nutrition and, and things. Like I really That's like to, to go to the human level with these athletes and really help people uh, understand them on a, on a personal level rather than just like, you know, tell me about your training, tell me about your sleep philosophies and your nutrition, et cetera. And um not that there's anything wrong with the, the other stuff as well. It's just sort of where my, my natural instinct is. But mm -hmm. to your question, um, the first thing that came into my mind was a, a podcast that I did really recently with a, an Australian ultra runner named Lucy Bartholomew. And she has also kind of gone through a couple of years of, um, yeah, sort of just rough road after having just this insane upper trajectory in her career of improvement 
and uh, sort of rising to a world class level at a very young age, and then hitting. I was going to say she's like twenty three, right? Yeah, she's only, she's about to turn twenty five, but she's been in the sport nearly as long as me. Like it's a crazy mm-hmm. story. I would definitely encourage people to to listen to it. It's been actually probably our most popular podcast ever. But she, um, yeah, one of the the phrases that she used that I actually used as the title of the podcast is new level, new devil, meaning that no matter where you are in life, no matter what level you're at, you're always going to have some devil to confront. And there's never going to be a point when you crest some hill and become world champion to where there's no longer a big boss to fight. And she actually used the, uh, the analogy of video games. And when you go up every new level, there's a new there's a new boss that you have to confront until you finally get to the end. And I just love that. I love that the philosophy or the, the, yeah, just the concept of new level, new devil. And it really helps you to, I think, be more comfortable with just the daily process, the daily grind, enjoying the activity for what it is and not being obsessed or corrupted by this feeling of like, eventually I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to, beat all the bosses, all the devils out there because every level there's a devil. And um, it's all about, I, I think, sort of confronting them with uh, with grace and integrity along the way. Love it. Okay, that that obviously then I have to ask, what is your, like, what is one of your current devils? Oh, geez. Well, I mean, definitely like coming through injury and stuff. That was like a really hard period of my life. Like, I'm not going to lie. It was a 12 months of just pure agony, physically, emotionally, psychologically. And and honestly, right now, I, I feel as comfortable in my skin as I have in a long time. I feel like I'm really... Um, enthusiastic about everything that I'm working on. Of course, like it's not easy. So I would say the the sort of devil side of things for me is like confronting the roller coaster uh, of like entrepreneurship with what we're trying to build. And there's days where I'm just consumed with a deep confidence that we're onto something and we are going to make a big impact. And then I have other days where I'm like, this is such a waste of time and money. What am I doing? Like, this is never going to be a thing, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and so that in talking to people in my network who have been through this sort of entrepreneur journey, uh, have been great resources for me to sort of rely on. And there's such a parallel between the journey of an athlete too, because you just have these insane highs and then these just like days where you're just convinced that you're you're a fraud and you're washed up. And then in between, you just have these days where just like nothing happens. You're just like, going through the motions and uh, trying to work towards a goal, but with not much happening, just mundane daily training and daily work. And uh, so that's been my, my devil recently is like, yeah, kind of coming to terms with the journey of entrepreneurship. Okay. I love that you said that. Um, It's so funny because we, we tend to work with a lot of people who pretty much like every week they come and it's like, this week, you know, I've made this big decision this week, like this is the new big goal. This is the new big plan. And there's always like this big up, like if you just charted it on the week, there'd always be like a spike. <laughs> yeah. just, like the, the kind of gradual, like, and we're back to, to the baseline by, you know, Wednesday yeah. um, versus these like consistent, boring days. And I think like the boring days are actually sort of what means you're on the right track in a weird way. A hundred percent. And it's the same with training, right? You've put a goal on the calendar three, four months down the road, and then you just go to work and you just start chipping away every day. And sometimes you, you feel amazing. Sometimes you feel completely awful, but most days you just feel completely average (laughs) and you just keep, you just keep stacking these average days up over weeks and months. And then, uh, yeah, you, you rest a little bit as I'm doing now. And then you hope, uh, when the day comes, when it matters most that, uh, you have what it takes. 
Mm-hmm. It's funny. My coach and I, or I've started calling uh, those days the fancy business days because I used to write down like nothing fancy, all business. <laughs> and then we just like annotated it to just like fancy business. Like that's fancy our day. Business. So that's I like every that. day of the week for I'm me. I'm going to adopt that. <laughs> I'm going to adopt that. It's, it's just such a good kind of like phrase for, okay, yep. Just another, another day. Just got it done. We're just taking a quick break from today's episode to talk to you about Inside Tracker. So you want to take charge of your health and wellness. That's why you're here. You're trying to do all the right things for your body to get more energy, better sleep, and a healthy immune system, and you probably want to improve your performance. And of course, live a healthy, adventurous life for a long time. But it's confusing out there. There's so much information and misinformation, and what works for someone else might not work for you. You want a clear picture of what your body looks like on the inside, a clear measure of whether your diet and exercise choices are helping or hurting, and a clear idea of who and what to trust when it comes to health, wellness, and performance guide. Founded in 2009, Inside Tracker is the ultra-personalized performance system that analyzes data from your blood, DNA, and fitness tracker to help you optimize your body and reach your health and wellness goals. The recommendations that come from the analysis are ultra-personalized, and you can choose the ones that are most compatible with your lifestyle. Each recommendation is directly linked to a peer-reviewed scientific publication. And Inside Tracker doesn't just show the normal biomarker zones, they show you the optimal biomarker zones and numbers that are best for your body. And now, for a limited time, you can get 25% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com slash consummate. That is insidetracker.com slash consummate. All right, now back to the episode. You were injured in 2019, 2020 pandemic. Uh, yeah. How does that feel as an athlete who is used to doing all of these huge races? Yeah, it, that's it two was years. Quite, I know it was, and especially sort of in your your early mid thirties, it's and you sort of like looking at the clock, like tick tock, <laughs> man, like let's go. But um, yeah, so I was lucky to come out of 2019, which was the year of personal hell for me. And uh, started 2020 on a really high note. I finished third at the Trans Grand Canaria 125K, which is a race in the Canary Islands, one of the most important races in the world. And very much like a huge relief for me to get back on the podium at a big race and feel like I was back on track and that I wasn't as washed up as I had felt for more than 12 months at that point. But I had this idea last year that I was calling the revenge tour, which was basically to, uh, yeah, obviously take, take vengeance on, on the year of, of injury, but also it had like a deeper meaning for me because in college, um, we, when I was playing lacrosse, my freshman year, we were ranked number one in the country. We were undefeated and we got kicked out of the national tournament because two of our players were academically ineligible. And the, oh, no. the next year, we called it the revenge tour. And we carried just this sense of like, anger with us. And I mean, it's it sounds bad to say that, but it was more like just a sense of like, ferocious competitiveness. And that even sounds bad, too, because that's not really my nature. No, but totally get it. <laughs> well, you, you understand what I'm trying to say is like, I just wanted to approach the 2020 season with that sense of like, I am here to, you know, race and compete. And, uh, and so part of my whole idea with the revenge tour was also to go back to races that I'd competed at in the past and where I wasn't particularly happy with my performance. Trans Grand Canaria was one of those races. So I felt like I started my revenge tour on the right track. And I guess the other funny thing is during my lacrosse, uh, season revenge tour we came out every game with a pirate flag on a lacrosse stick instead of like so nerdy oh it was (laughs) but it was amazing it's like emblematic of uh of just our attitude and so so then at that race in in spain my coach came and he brought uh like a skull and crossbones jolly roger roger flag for me and it was just like we're doing it man and then of course had to fly home under duress due to the uh the covid pandemic which happened basically right then right after um the race in spain and so yeah the 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 revenge tour was put on ice and it was very frustrating because i i was desperate to kind of get back to sport and competition again and 
um, it taught me another, another lesson in patience. And honestly, I think it might be ultimately a good thing just because I have been in the sport a long time and I have put myself through a lot of really, really hard days out there. And so having a year of injury and a year to sort of focus on my professional life, focus on the podcast, focus on really trying to get behind the sport and push it into the next generation as much as I can and help some of the athletes who are coming up behind me. That's been a, a really great use of my energy in 2020. But uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm desperate to get back to a start line and, and uh, <laughs> get the revenge tour off to off to another start but um i don't know i i don't necessarily feel that same um attitude like i did at the beginning of last year so um we'll, we'll probably I mean, we'll retire the concept but yeah <laughs> now i'm like oh you need to get like a skull and crossbones tattoo it's <laughs> yeah. the obvious next yeah. step i know yeah <laughs> Tattoos are a sore subject in our household. I've been talking about it, but uh, oh dear, no, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, my my husband has been very lucky. All of the tattoo parlors in Ontario have been closed pretty much for the past year, so uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's been saved from that for the most part. But, yeah, you know, um, okay. But you have this thing coming up this coming weekend. Yeah. So tell me about that. What's what's sure. up with that? Sure. So. I mean, I guess I might as well say, uh, because I'm assuming this won't, won't come out for, you know, a few days or whatever, but yeah, basically, um, my main objective for the season is the hard rock 100, which is, uh, coming up in July of this year. It's been canceled the last two years. It's one of the most legendary hundred mile races in North America and the world really. And uh, a race I've wanted to do my whole career and, uh, haven't been able to yet. So that's the main goal for the season. But for me, it's really important to get longer, harder efforts in leading into a big race like that. And because there's not a lot of racing opportunities to be had, you know, there's this FKT phenomenon in our sport, the fastest known time where you can take an established route and try and run it as fast as you can and try and run it faster than anybody else has. I did something similar in Joshua Tree in March. Uh, where I set the fastest known time on the Joshua Tree Traverse, which is about 37 miles. And now this weekend, I'm going to try my hand at the Backbone Trail, also here in Southern California, which is about 70 miles. And um, I think the current record's about 10 hours, a little over 10 hours. And so I'll try and run a little bit faster than that if I can. Uh, but most of all, it's it's designed to be a big, huge training day uh, that will sort of launch me into 100 mile fitness for the Hard Rock 100, which is coming up in July. So that's the the idea of uh, why I'm doing it and, and what I'm doing this weekend. Okay, I'm gonna have to say we're incredibly jealous of that because in a normal year, we actually probably would have been out uh, in Oxnard and the Backbone Trail is one of my husband's like favorite places to ride. It's one of my yeah. favorite places to run. So incredibly jealous over here. Oh, sweet. That's gonna be fun. Yeah, it kind of finishes <laughs> down there in Oxnard. I haven't really, I, I've been on parts of the trail, I know in, in races, but I've never done the full thing. So I'm looking Ooh. forward to it. It's gonna be good. Yeah. <laughs> now... With something like that, will you have people dropping water for you? What is that going to look like? Sure. So again, going back to the fastest known time FKT phenomenon, there's different ways that you can do it. Supported is one way, which is the way that I'll do it. You can go self-supported or unsupported. Uh, the the supported uh, fashion or the supported uh, way that I'll do it will involve uh, my wife who will come to various places be able to switch out my water bottles and that'll be critically important to me being able to run, run fast. So yeah, my wife and then um, our colleague Ryan who works with us on the podcast and the app and stuff. Uh, he's sort of like our creative guy who does all the audio video photography. He's going to fly down from Seattle too. And so we'll have a, a small group and uh, we'll do our best to run fast and make cool content about it. Nice. Uh, when you, when you do those runs, actually, you mentioned bottles. Do you run with handhelds, waistband, pack? What's your what's your instrument of choice? Yeah. So I like to run with these new hydration vests, which most of the outdoor brands are making now. Who are serious about being in trail and ultra running? I run for the North Face, and they make a great uh, 
a hydration vest, which is just a really lightweight backpack basically. And uh, so I carry usually two or three half liter water bottles, just sort of soft flasks. So they're collapsible and very light. Um, and yeah, so sort of have pockets for those on the front of the vest. And uh, sometimes I'll, I'll carry them in my hands as I'm just sort of like out there trying to replenish uh, fluids and electrolytes and things like that. Um, but yeah, I think the, yeah, obviously everybody's got their own, their own strategy, but these hydration vests are so well-made now to where it's, yeah, it, oftentimes in a lot of these races, that's kind of all you see. You don't see the handhelds as much. You definitely don't see the reservoir with hose system, camelback style stuff nearly as much as mm -hmm. you did sort of in the, you know, 10 years ago. So, um, that, that's my strategy too. Okay. Excellent. Now this, this one's like 70 miles. So pretty close to like a hundred K. How does that stack up to like a hundred miler? Cause part of me is almost like hundred and a hundred. It's practically the same. Yeah. Would you stick to like the same fueling strategy, the same, like every strategy other than the fact that it's longer? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So obviously, I, I don't know. I guess the, the thing that I like to impress on people who come into the sport is that it's not as if it gets exponentially harder after a hundred K when you're doing a hundred miler, it's just a matter of continuing to do the little things well and put one foot in front of the other in terms of pacing. Yeah. This is something that you kind of have to feel out in real time just because I am not somebody who does really mathematical analysis of people who've done the efforts before. I'm very much somebody who likes to run by feel and just kind of, gauge my effort based on subjective feedback that my body's giving me and my energy levels. <gasps> subjective um, feedback? You don't have like 18 monitors and like a chip in your brain or something telling you how you feel? Weird. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, I'm very much like a, uh, yeah, anti-technological uh, person. Although I do use a GPS watch. I'm never somebody who goes into the Strava rabbit holes and does the does the math and checks the splits and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, I guess the, that's sort of my approach. Um, and in terms of fueling and things like that, it, it's very much the same too. I, I like to drink basically all my calories. So I use just high calorie drink mix in my water bottles. I like to do that because it just simplifies things. I guess it's also part of my personality is just keeping things really simple and being able to get, my fluids and my calories from one place just eliminates a step and just makes things easier in my brain at least. So, uh, yeah, drink a bunch of these water bottles filled with uh, drink mix and, mm -hmm. uh, smash a few Red Bulls out there when I see my wife and, uh, I'll be on my way. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Now, with like a hundred miler, what percentage would you say is mental versus physical, especially in say like the last half? I mean, obviously ultra running is very much uh, a mental exercise as well. And I think the important thing to know for people kind of coming into the sport is that you're always going to have an excuse to quit. And so it's always about how you confront the adversity in real time. And this is something that absolutely is trainable, that absolutely does require this sort of emotional fitness, to use the word that I sort of used earlier. And um, I think some people, it sort of comes more naturally. For me, I, I'm very much a, a very stubborn person. I'm also extremely impatient. And these two personality traits – I think are hindrances to me in my personal life, but uh, really serve me well as an athlete. And so dealing with the, should I drop out demons is, is actually very, very rare for me. Um, but I know for a lot of people, you do deal with the question of like, is this even worth it? Like, should I keep going? And that's where the mental training, the mental practice is, that's where it pays dividends, right? It's, it's all about confronting those moments of self-doubt, uh, confronting the moments where it would make total sense for you to drop out and 
just take a few more steps forward and, and, uh, you know, break things into small, smaller, uh, chunks and get to the next tree, get to the next aid station and just keep plotting away. And when you do that a few times, I think what you recognize is that you really can put yourself through some amazing freaking things. And when, when it comes to life off the trail, once you've proven to yourself that you can do these hard things over and over and over and that you don't shrink from those moments of adversity and that you choose not to quit when things get hard, it pays huge dividends in your personal life and your professional life in your relationships as well. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I just freaking love the sport so much, man. It just changes people's lives. It changes how people approach um, their relationships. It changes how they approach the things that they do outside of the sport as well. And I think it's a beautiful thing. I love that so much. Um, now I'm going to say like devil's advocate here or flip side of it. Sure. Uh, have you ever had a race where in retrospect, you sort of wish there had been that like demon on your shoulder being like, Hey, probably drop out. This is probably a time you should stop. Yeah. Honestly, only once. And it was a time when I put myself in the hospital, I went so hard. I, I basically, I had a heat stroke in, it was a short race too. It was only 25 kilometers. I went into it very much as a, a training effort. It wasn't a serious thing for me. I did it instead of going out and doing a long, hard workout on my own that day. And so the night before, like my wife and I went out, I think we were celebrating something. I had a couple drinks, was very I think I I showed up dehydrated on a hot day Mm -hmm. and I remember just feeling completely awful in like a weird way and then uh, blacked out somewhere to have very little memory of what happened. And uh, there's some very scary pictures of me out on the trail and thank goodness some hikers found me and called an ambulance who, and these, these, uh, paramedics, thank goodness, uh, hiked in and, and wheeled me out of there. And, um, yeah, I have, I have no recollection of it, but they told me I was, uh, I was teetering on the edge and that my, my core temperature was like 105 and I was unconscious for a half hour or something like that. And obviously made my, my wife and my family incredibly scared, but it's, um, a heat stroke's not an unusual thing. It, it happens to people all the time. I'm lucky that I was a younger, healthier person when it happened because it can, you can die just from mm-hmm. overheating. But as long as you cool, as long as you get treatment and you cool down, uh, you can you recover from it really well. And uh, so that was the the one moment in my career where it was like, holy smokes! Like, I I am really stubborn and impatient because there, I I there's. Yeah, I nearly ran myself. Uh, I ran myself into the hospital for sure, and it could have been worse. And and so mm-hmm. that's something that I've been very cognizant of since then, especially in, on warmer days. Is just not showing up dehydrated, making sure that I pay attention to that those little things as well. Because um, yeah, that's something I, I definitely want to avoid. <laughs> Yes. Um, that actually is, is sort of an interesting thing with the, the night before and sort of like the week leading into something like you're doing this weekend. Um, it's not just, you know, everyone always wants to talk about like what to eat or drink like on the bike or on the run. But I always say like so much of nutrition and so much of that is like the few days leading up and like, can you show up like hydra- at like the 100% hydrated level so you're yeah. not trying to keep filling up like an already partially empty thing. Yeah. Uh, so the night before a hard effort, what, what does that look like for you? What, what do you, what's your go-to dinner? Yeah. So well, I think just piggybacking on what you said, I think hydration is something that and just normal daily personal life. Hydration is the, one of the biggest unlocks average normal athletes and, and even professional athletes can, have in their training and something that I pay attention to a lot is just drink a lot of water, sometimes have some electrolytes just to make sure you're not diluting yourself too much. But hydration um, is just such a critical thing. And I think there's a lot of people in the world who just walk around daily at a, in a chronically dehydrated state. And obviously, 
Hi, being hydrated also helps with flexibility. It helps just keep your muscles and soft tissue a little bit more lubricated and more pliable and uh, things like that. So, I mean, I always have water around and I'm always drinking. And uh, I think that's something that I would recommend to everybody. Uh, in terms of what I eat usually before big efforts, usually something very simple, um, kind of like pasta or rice and vegetables and pizza, things like that. And um, I also, the other thing that I think would just kind of be relevant to mention here is I always like to eat really early on the um, day before a big effort like that, uh, just because it helps me to, to get to sleep, helps me to rest when I'm not feeling like I'm really digesting something. And then I'll wake up in the morning, make sure that I have more calories coming into the tank before we set off. And usually that's more simple foods like pastries or toast, something like that. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. I was doing a nutrition talk a couple of years ago and I remember a woman was just like horrified when I said like a bagel is my pre-race thing. She just could not get over that. That was she's like, not like oatmeal with like bear. I was like, no, just a bagel. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have a, we have a saying here in our little, our little company that nutrition is the politics of ultra running and that it's just like, <laughs> it's such a third rail subject, you know, and there'll be people who listen to me say whatever I say and say, no, well, this is the way that you should do it. This is the way it works for me. And it's just like, you know, more power to you. I totally support you doing your thing. I'll continue to do my thing. And, uh, at the end of the day, who are we to judge? Yes. Okay. And I, I should have asked you this earlier when we started talking about your your work and your your racing, but how how do you balance all of these things sort of throughout the week on that like day-to-day -day basis? What are sort of like the habits you use to get through the day and actually like check everything off? But not I mean, you're you're a functioning human right now. I don't see like huge bags under your eyes. You're barely like focused barely. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well I, I should say since we launched the app it's been very difficult like i've been out of balance quite a lot and i've been working just non-stop seven days a week for months on end luckily uh it's been super fun and it is highly motivating and i feel the same way about it that i did about trail running 10 years ago and that i just can't stop thinking about it and i love it um but with the day job, I, I'm just very lucky in that I've always worked remotely and always had the support of my colleagues to travel and to train at the level that I want to and recognize that I'm uh, fortunate to be in that position. And then you know, with the, the training, of course, I feel the same way that I do about the, the entrepreneurship thing now and that it's just like what I love to do. And so it's easier to sort of be out of balance when you're doing things that you love, but still it's a cha it's been a challenge recently and something that I'm trying to navigate with a little bit uh, more um, intelligence recently because it has, it's definitely unsustainable. What I'm doing right now is definitely unsustainable. And so mm -hmm. trying to figure out the best path to streamline all the things that I'm working on right now, because between the day job and the podcast and the app and, and my training and trying to be a good husband and having two high energy dogs and uh, just trying to also have a social life and things like that. It's been a little overwhelming. So I, I wouldn't necessarily have great advice for people looking at how to achieve balance. And I'm certainly open to suggestions myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to ask, I know we kind of joked about sleep philosophy, but do you sleep? Yeah. I do. Yeah, I do sleep. Uh, I, I guess the one thing that I'm actually pretty uh, religious about, I guess I would say is that, I guess it's not necessarily religious about it. It's just I can't really help it. But I just like tumble into bed at 8, 830 every night. And, and uh, I'm pretty good at like that being like my hard stop. And I just, you know, put the phone away, put the email away, um, pick up a book and, or just, you know, zonk out. And, uh, I, I've always been early to bed, early to rise type person. So I usually get up five, five thirty. Um, 
but, and so that gives me, that gives me eight or nine hours of sleep pretty much every night. Uh, I do use one of these aura ring things and recently it's been saying, Hey bro, like you actually need to sleep a little bit more. And, uh, <laughs> I've sort of been saying, no, man, you, you, you don't understand. Like I can't sleep right now. And then I realize I'm talking to a stupid ring and the, in an app on my phone. And, um, but yeah, I, uh, I think it's a, everybody's got their own sort of personal rhythms. Some people are, they just function better when they stay up later and then they train in the afternoons. I'm very much a go to bed as soon as early as I can get up early, get my day started with some good training, hammer on work all day and then tumble into bed again at eight (laughs) o'clock. So (laughs) plus time for dogs in a social life. Exactly. If I can. Awesome. Um, and oh, we haven't talked about it, but let's talk about the the Red Bulls Wings for Life World Run. What's the deal with that that's coming up? Yeah, so it's uh, it's an amazing event. I'm super happy to be involved again this year. So basically, the Wings for Life is an event that is done every year. And this year, it's going to be all virtual, but typically they uh, take place these races kind of in different locations all over the world. And then they have uh, the at-based run so that anybody can take place anywhere in the world at the exact same time, which is one of the, the cool and novel things about it, in that it's very much a world run, as the name would suggest, and, and it's all done simultaneously. So, for example, this year, it's coming up on Sunday, May 9th, so definitely everybody go to wingsforlifeworldrun.com and register for the event. It's super duper fun, but as I was saying, it happens at the same place all over the world simultaneously. So this year on Sunday, May 9th at 4 a.m. Pacific time, we'll be starting uh, with the app-based run. I'll be uh, here on the West Coast, so I'll be getting up bright and early to do it. But that, of course, means that it starts at 7 a.m. on the East Coast. It's sort of like afternoon in Europe sort of late night in Asia. And the really cool thing about it is that you just know that there's thousands and thousands of people all out doing the same thing at the same time, uh, which is highly, highly uh, novel and motivating. And the race format is also very novel and really interesting and fun in that you don't necessarily know how far you're going to race. Obviously, most runners who've done a lot of races know, hey, I'm going to do a 10K or I'm doing a 50K or I'm doing a 100 miler. And you know very much how far you're going to be running when you start. This is different in that you basically just try and run as long and as hard as you can until the finish line catches you. And so basically the whole concept evolved from this idea of a catcher car. So this is when people are actually gathering four races before it went all virtual the last couple of years. And basically all the runners start. And then a short time later, the catcher car starts and, and accelerates at a uh, sort of increasing interval until the car passes every runner. So when the car passes you, that's when your race is over. So it's a little complicated to explain, but it's a really cool and unique concept and something that, uh, yeah, I think people have found a, a lot of, uh, entertainment and doing. I remember when I did it in Southern California a couple of years ago, I went out very much, I was coming off a hundred mile race and there very much just to show my support and have fun with less of a competitive spirit and uh, intended to run 15 or 20 miles, ultimately ended up running like 35 miles or something. That's that it. Did. Like, I don't even know you that well. And I'm yeah. super skeptical of that yeah, when you right. started saying it. Yeah. So it was, uh, <laughs> It just sort of caught up in the in the environment and in the the spirit of the race and in the cool novel uh, concept uh, of this sort of catch line, this finish line coming to you sort of idea is, is really fun. And then the other thing that the most important thing that is really important to emphasize here is that the Wings for Life Foundation is probably the biggest foundation in the world dedicated to spinal cord injury rehabilitation and finding a cure for spinal cord injuries. And so every year it raises raises amazing sums of money and every dollar is matched by Red Bull 
uh, who has been an amazing advocate for this cause. And some of their athletes have been personally touched by this condition and their efforts to uh, spearhead or be at the tip of the spear of the research to uh, empower people to find solutions has been incredibly inspiring. And I think for me, as somebody who's been part of the event for probably five years now, the most um, rewarding part of it has been my opportunity to interact with some of the Wings for Life ambassadors. So these are individuals who have suffered spinal cord injuries themselves during uh, their lives, oftentimes um, have been in wheelchairs in uh, quadriplegic or paraplegic uh, states for, for decades. And they just have the most incredible perspective and just the most admirable attitudes about uh, their position in life and come to every day with this sense of hope and this sense of um, can do spirit and makes me just look at my own history with injury or just the small little trivial adversities that I go through day to day and just laugh at, at the immaturity in which I sometimes deal with these things. And so it's been a true honor and treat to interact with the Wings for Life ambassadors. The race itself is super fun and entertaining to do, but also most importantly, it's for an amazing cause. And so I would highly encourage everybody to go register for the event. Join me Sunday, May 9th, um, and the, the donation that you make and the registration fee is going to an incredible cause. And every dollar that you spend is being matched by Red Bull. And together we can all work to uh, find a, a cure for spinal cord injury. And what they say is run, run for those who can't. And uh, I think that's a, a worthy message and uh, uh, an admirable thing for us all to sort of do occasionally is to use our, our gift of physical fitness uh, in service of, of those who haven't been able to uh, really experience the joys of just getting out and, and going for a simple run. And, and we take it for granted every day, including myself. And so I'm really looking forward to the Wings for Life World Run. I appreciate you allowing me the opportunity to talk about it a little bit. And I would definitely encourage all your listeners to, to sign up. Yeah, no, I love that. I think, I mean, it sounds like a really fun event and then yeah, for, for a really good cause. So hopefully people will check that out. And you said that's wingsforlife.com. I think it's wingsforlifeworldrun.com. Um, it's well, we'll put a link in the show notes. Google. So. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, I, I, I know I found it very easily just through a simple, uh, Google search. So if I can do it, you can do it. It's, uh, I'm sure it'll be the, <laughs> The first thing that pops up and uh, yeah, check it out, make a donation, register um, and uh, join us for the app base world run on May 9th. Awesome. And okay, before we before we close out on the note of finding all of these things on the interwebs, tell everyone where they can find you, where they can find pillars, both podcast and app, all of the things. Yeah, so my handle on Twitter and Instagram is Dylan Bo, D Y L A N B O. Uh, so you can follow me there. I also post all my training on Strava. Uh, your listeners are, are into Strava. Uh, I know that's a, a really fun tool for people to uh, sort of connect on and, and sort of log their own training and see what other people do and find inspiration. Uh, again, my app is called Pillars, P-Y-L-L-A-R-S. Again, it's the first and only app, to my knowledge, that is designed specifically for trail and ultra runners. So if you uh, are new to the sport or you just generally want a community and more helpful insights as to how you can be better, join us. We'd love to have you. It's both on Android and on iOS. So we're on both platforms. And then the podcast, like I said, is under the Pillars umbrella. So just search Pillars. Uh, on your favorite podcast player, P-Y-L-L-A-R-S, or my name, which is Dylan Bowman, and it should pop up. And uh, yeah, we also started a YouTube channel under the same name too. So we've been putting out some fun content. We've actually been putting in podcasts on the YouTube channel as well. So I definitely encourage people to uh, go subscribe to our channel there if they want some more good uh, trail and ultra running inspiration. 
And finally, I did just Google it. It is Wings for Life worldrun.com. So go register and uh, join us on May 9th. Amazing. You can tell someone's a good podcast host by the fact that you could Google that while you were dropping all of your links <laughs> and still manage to like not pause in the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> That's I, uh, how you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love talking if you can't tell. So uh, it's, yeah, it's, no, it's great this, to, uh, uh, to have the conversation. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to to share my story and to talk a little bit about Wings for Life. And it's been great to get to know you a little bit too. Yeah, no, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you enjoyed this or any of our past episodes, do us a solid and leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. And check out our book, Becoming a Consummate Athlete, over at consummateathlete.com. Questions or comments? Find us over on Instagram, at consummateathlete, and we will see you next week. <laughs>